in, in casting uh, Two Moon Junction, uh, just the way that I found Robert Downey Jr. through the good offices of Linda Francis and gave him his SAG card, Linda brought me another opportunity on Two Moon Junction, and I found the actress Mila Jovovich, and I gave her her first job in the motion picture business, and I signed her SAG card. I had also just seen, right before we started casting this movie, Jim Jarmusch's picture, Stranger Than Paradise. And in it, one of his characters, who's an Eastern European woman, is obsessed with listening on her Walkman to Screamin' Jay Hawkins. So I really thought that picture was cool. And I loved that movie. And I thought her character was cool. And I thought that everything we did in Two Moon Junction should be cool. So when Zalman King told me that he wanted um, a Louisiana uh, a, a squeeze box player I'm, I'm stretching for his name, Joel Soignier, I want to say. I might not have it perfectly right. Uh, I listened to his music and I thought, well, you know, the end of the movie is in New Orleans and you're, you're thinking of a good guy and we could probably get him. I said, but wouldn't it be cool to have Screamin' Jay Hawkins? I mean, he was just in Stranger Paradise, but not on screen. We, we could be the guys that put him on screen. I think that'd be so cool. Zalman got it on one. I did not have to sell him this idea. He was like, go get him. Yeah. Zalman loved things that were cool. So uh, I, I, I tasked my casting director with putting me in touch with Screamin' Jay Hawkins. This is how good the late Linda Francis was. She found through all of her networking one phone number that was the phone number to a liquor store just north of Franklin, about three blocks from where that new Scientology building is near Vine. And apparently, that was the only way the world had to find Screamin' Jay Hawkins. He was at the bottom of his barrel. He, he was not booked for anything. He was living with a very, very strong woman, Afro, African American, who was pretty much his, his uh, goal, uh, uh, his mama. I mean, she, she was paying the bills, paying the rent, getting him the food, whatever money he was stealing from her purse, he was taken to the liquor store and getting his liquor. And the only phone number you could reach him at was at that liquor store. And we reached him and, and I reached out to him and he almost ran into the office. I mean, we, we saw him a lot faster than we thought we were going to. And uh, Zalman and I were just in hog heaven. This is screaming Jay Hawkins. And he really wants to be in our movie. Now, a couple things. The first is, on the day, Solomon and I didn't particularly do the kind of research you would think somebody would do when they're getting into business with another person because it's a very incidental part at the very end of the movie. And what happens is the camera starts with a close on Scream and Jay. He sings for a half a minute or so. And then it moves off and follows our character for the tag in the movie. And the song he's playing continues on. But when, when Screamin' Jay says to the wardrobe person, how should, I, how should I come to the set? And the wardrobe person asks the director, and I'm in the room. Said, oh, just tell him to do his act. Neither of us had ever seen his act. So on the day when he's sitting behind the piano, this African-American soul singer, and he's got a bone in his nose... <laughs> We're looking at each other and going, this isn't very politically correct. <laughs> um, I don't think we can shoot this. I, I, I don't know if this is the right thing to do. I mean, and now we're having a conversation with Jay suggesting in very strong suggestions that he not present himself on camera this way. And, and he's, he's starting to get upset that we've never seen the act. He says, you want Screamin' Jay Hawkins? This is Screamin' Jay Hawkins. So he's on... He's on, on film in, in our cam on camera in our film doing his act the way he does his act now the postscript to this is one year after the movie is released this man who who we found through a phone number at a liquor store at the bottom of his barrel with with no with no announcement just comes right to my office and presents himself to uh the person who's who's at the desk in front of my desk and says uh I'm screaming Jay Hawkins. I'm here to see Borchers. And I can hear him. <laughs> I said, send him in. So I was just doing business. I wasn't on the phone or in a meeting. And he comes in and he sits down. 
before he sits down, gives me a bear hug that's almost crushing. And he starts to tear and cry. And he sits down and he says, I just bought a house which I've paid cash for. I'm on my way back to Europe to do my second European tour. And all of this happened when people saw me in Two Moon Junction. And you changed my life. What a feeling. And what an amazing man. The funniest, the funniest thing that happened that I ever heard was Sherilyn Fenn, obviously, is in Two Moon Junction. And after he met her and he came to realize who she was, he wrote a song and it's on one of his albums and it's called Sherilyn Fenn. Well, when the woman who was the woman who we knew was supporting him and such, who he stayed with for I don't know how long, but for at least a while, found out about this, there was no doubt in her mind that he was having an affair with Sherilyn Fenn, which then led to the infamous story of her trying to kill him with a meat cleaver. <laughs> and he survived that. He's not with us today, but his songs will live on.